I know what you did, Malfoy. You hexed her, didn't you? Hi, I'm Nat, he's Matt, and we've got your geek news right here. And this week, it's a review of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, the sixth adaptation of the seven-book series. Now, last time we were reviewing a Harry Potter movie, Matt was the noob and I was the expert, but as it turns out, Order of the Phoenix was good enough to make Matt read a book. Yeah, which means it's pretty good. Basically, <laughs> impatience took over. <laughs> so for the first time, Matt has to deal with the pain I've been dealing with and some of you guys have been dealing with since 2001, as the movie adaptations have left out more and more from the books in order to make a movie that people can watch without a diaper. And you know what? With Half-Blood Prince clocking in at just over two and a half hours, they're cutting it pretty close yeah, to diaper time. Yeah, exactly. So first we'll look at this one, uh, spoiler free, as a film, as best we can. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty bits, talking about the essential changes between the book and the movie. Yeah, punch me now. In my life, I've seen things that are truly horrific. So this movie has a lot of plots going on at once. There are the machinations on the side of good. You've got Harry being sent out on this manipulative mission. Mm -hmm. You've got Dumbledore gallivanting around, plus the love stories. Mm -hmm. And then there's the vanishing cabinet mystery plot on the side of the Death Eaters happening all at the same time. Not to mention the duality of Snake. Exactly, and all of this going on, the film plot still manages to make sense. Which, you know, that's kind of more than we can say for a lot of summer movies yeah, this year. Yeah, exactly. So you know what, honestly, I was pretty impressed with how funny the film actually ended up being in parts. You know, the films have taken on a darker and darker and darker tone each time, but you know what, Emma and Daniel and Rupert, they had some really great comedic timing, and yeah. they brought some really much needed relief to an otherwise tense, tense story. Personally, nah, I didn't, I don't know if I like the comedic stuff that much. The tension is what Harry Potter's all about. Harry Potter's not a comedy, but that aside, I mean, as a film, it was good. It was good. And Tom Felton's Draco Malfoy is so wonderfully flawed and vulnerable in this one. It was And you know what? Great. Ivana Lynch managed to make a Luna Lovegood that was such a delightful departure. Again, she was from so the heavy... random. Like she's oh. sitting at the table before the, the, the game and she's wearing this Gryffindor costume. Oh, like, it was perfect. What the it heck? was perfect. Because Pretty I mean, funny. I remember that in the book and it looked exactly as ridiculous as I was. Oh hoping. my gosh. And on top of all that, the Half Lip Prince might also be the best looking Harry Potter movie yet. You know, the visual effects in this one were so subtle and seamless. The exteriors of the castle, the, where you could see characters, it was so beautiful yeah. from one spot to another. The direction really was top notch, and I'm really excited that Yates is going to be directing Potter all the way up until the end. Mm -hmm. And you know what? With all this glowing praise, one has to ask whether we liked it more than Order of the Phoenix. I didn't. But now that I've read the books, my perspective is so different. So different. Yeah, now you know how I've been feeling this entire time. I know, I know. I mean, it, it feels like as long as it was... I mean, it was long... Okay, here's the thing with me. The movie was long. It was beautiful to look at. The acting and performance was very strong. But part of me kind of feels like nothing happened. I mean, like, yes, we got to point A to point B. Things happen in the plot that need to happen to set you up for Deathly Hollows. But at the same time, I mean... It kind of feels like nothing happened. I don't know what to say. They focused way too much, I feel like, on the romantic relationships. And yeah. I mean, yes, that was important in the book, but come on, there are so many more things happening. Uh, and you know what? I mean, with all the Quidditch that was in there, I don't, I don't really know why when they're focusing on things like that, other things wind up getting cut. So I guess, I, I guess let's go into this as an adaptation exactly. of the sixth book of the series. Yeah, and, get into and some then spoilers. some spoiler stuff because I have some crap to say. What you are looking at are memories, in this case pertaining to one individual. This is perhaps the most important memory I've collected. I'd like you to see it. Holy crap, was that ever compressed? I could feel it from the very start, but by the third act, as Dumbledore and Harry were heading off to the cave, I could already tell the pacing was ruining the story for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, skipping over Quidditch games, no biggie, the love stories didn't really suffer. But 
Damn, we missed the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. the Black House creature, memories of Voldemort's parents, and the Slytherin and Hufflepuff Horcruxes, the entire mystery of who the Half-Blood Prince is, the epic battle in Hogwarts Ugh. when Fenrir gets Bill, and Dumbledore's poison drinking made no sense. Calm down, Matt. This is the second to last book in the series. There's a lot of moving forward the plot, and the movie does all those essential bits to get from book five to book seven. But they left out the funeral scene. I know, Matt. I've been complaining about this kind of crap for almost a decade now. Maybe you shouldn't have read the books if you wanted to keep enjoying the movies. Yeah, you know what? I mean, Snape's... Uh, there, there's things like Snape's disposition. I wouldn't have noticed how different he was... If you didn't already know what was going on in the next book. Yeah. That's the thing. So, like, Snape is supposed to be menacing and venomous and cruel, as he always is. But, but the meanest the movie, he's ever been. That's the thing. But in this movie, for some reason... He's neutral. He's very neutral. And, yeah. like, if you know what's going to happen in the seventh book, you can kind of see where this neutrality comes from or but like, that's not the where point. is like the duality of characters really coming through. That's not the point at all. He shouldn't have been like that at all. No. But meh. okay, but here's the thing that for me was like the biggest piss off. Yes, there were tons of things I have to take out to adapt the book to the movie. I know that happened. How do you take out that epic battle scene at the end? Oh. Dumbledore's death? Anticlimactic. Like are you kidding me? The whole thing with the vanishing cabinet that Draco Malfoy was working on, the point of it was to get those Death Eaters in there to attack Hogwarts to get Dumbledore. Like, not just I don't even to kick, understand. Not just to kick crap off the tables in the Great they Hall. They did nothing. Like, they, they, what's, what was the point of them even getting in there? I mean, like, Snape could have just killed Dumbledore for Draco and the three other Death Eaters didn't even have to be there. You know apparently I mean? they took that out because they were afraid it would be redundant, redundant with yeah. the great like, big insane. battle scene at the end of the Deathly Like, Hallows. if you're talking about redundancy, how about you take out all those Quidditch games? Because oh we have seen enough of that. I Are know. You Quidditch, Quidditch was cool break. in the first and second movie because the Dark Lord wasn't trying to take over the universe. But right now there's more important stuff going on than Ron and Quidditch practice. It's just like, if you want to take out stuff for pacing, if you're going to make a movie that's that like long... Like, if you're talking about redundant, take that crap Like, out. I'm some sorry. really the battle important stuff, stuff, epic. I mean, I'm not a big violence person, but I mean, like, you, Fenrir Greyback was terrifying in the books. Terrifying. And again, I know he's not as major as people like Snape or Dumbledore or Harry Potter. But you're supposed to be horrified of the idea. But you're horrified that he's in Hogwarts full of children because he loves the taste of children. You know what I mean? It's like little details like that. Oh, and speaking of other details, Harry Potter... Where the heck was his scar the entire time? It was very, very unnoticeable this I mean, time you around. saw it at the end, and I mean, like, yeah, maybe that's redundant talking about Harry Potter's scar all the time, but those are one of his, like, it's defining characteristics. He looks like James, has eyes like Lily, has unkempt hair, wears John Lennon glasses, and has a scar. You know what? There's no reason not to put all this stuff in except running time. And I've never watched any of these on DVD to see if there are deleted scenes, but a lot of their decisions seemed very purposeful, to specifically leave things out. So I'd be stunned if some of that stuff's been shot. I don't know what to say. I mean, like, yes, this is supposed to be one of the most critically acclaimed Harry Potter films to date. But, you know, Roger Ebert gave it a, a very good mark, apparently. Rotten Tomatoes has it somewhere in, like, the 90th percentile. It's like, really high on it's IMDb. It's very high. It's high on IMDb. It's some guy on Hollywood.com was talking about how it's going to get Oscar, Oscar contender. contender. You know, it's like, yes, you know what? No one is disagreeing that this is possibly the most beautiful Harry Potter movie to date. But... My God, like, as an adaptation? I mean, fine, no one's really critiquing it as an adaptation. I guess Oscars don't really care how it is adapted or what it's adapted from, and that's fine. But yeah, as a viewer, ultimately. which, I mean, like, let's be honest here. A lot of you people that were there for the midnight screening the night before, you guys were fans. You guys weren't just people watching the movie. To make you guys happy? I mean, what? Do they even care? No, obviously not. Well, you know what? They do care. They do care, and that's exactly why book seven is being split into two movies. Right, which, I mean, I'm looking forward to getting the next dose of Harry Potter so soon in 2010, and then mm -hmm. movie eight in 2011. Now, that's excellent. I, I can see that solving a lot of the rushed pacing issues, but I'm honestly concerned that they've left so much out, like the Ravenclaw tiara, things like that, that the wrap-up might just not be as satisfying and as clean as they were in the books. I mean, it's a definite possibility. If you want to fully enjoy the movies and not be completely peeved off by the changes. Honestly, your best bet is to read the book sometime in 2012 and just wait for the movies. Please just wait uh, for the movies. As much as I enjoyed reading the books, I second that. Yeah. Do not read them if you plan on enjoying the movies, and especially the next two. Cause, exactly. Uh. So, uh, Harry Potter aside, now that we've talked about it and wrapped it up, we've actually got District 9 coming up, G.I. Joe and Inglorious Bastards. Which we're really looking forward to for the summer. I, I want me some Nazi scalps. <laughs>
<laughs> so keep your eye right here. Leave us a comment on yourgeeknews.com and let us know what you think. Thanks. Bye.